Sport has the power to build strength and confidence. Heal, inspire, and bring communities together. This is Level Playing Field. Hello and welcome to Level Playing Field. I'm your host, Greg Westlake. Today we take a closer look at how Holland Blurview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital is using sport to better the lives of their clients. Up first though, we hit the mat with para-judo athlete Priscilla Gagne. Roughly translated from its native Japanese, judo means the way of gentleness. Which is quite ironic when you observe Priscilla Gagne throwing her training partner around the judo mat. Or competing on the international stage. It doesn't look gentle at all. And quite frankly, that is one of the things that Priscilla loves about judo. The ability to inflict her will on her opponents. Ultimately the best is just throwing them on their back because it's quick, it's satisfying. It's surprising, because you always go for it, but when it happens, you're like, oh. <laughs> um, and tapping out is really fun, because then they're submitting. You feel like that's right. You know, like this satisfying feeling of, I hope you're okay, but that felt good. <laughs> it may sound callous, but the drive to dominate an opponent in this violent waltz is a necessary element of the mental makeup of all combat sport athletes. Perfect. Another is the drive to develop their craft. Priscilla felt that desire when she first started the sport 10 years ago. Yes, like that. I loved seeing progression. I loved me measuring my progression. I loved learning different moves. I loved uh, being able to lift a man. And it's not muscle, you know, it's, it's, it's technique. But I think in the beginning that I loved the learning process. I loved learning. Her passion for getting better hasn't changed to this day. And the person in charge of her learning now is Sport Director for Judo Canada, Andre Sedej. Okay. They started working together in 2013 and have built a close relationship through long hours on the mat. Well done. Walk. Walk and relax. One of the things I really, really like about it, he has a really good radar of how far to push you. Like he knows, I don't know how he measures it, but he knows your limit and he knows when you know you're at your limit and he knows when to push you past what you think your limit is, but then he also knows when it's time to like change it or do something different. <laughs> Poor guy, I probably have given him more earfuls than he knows what to do with, but he just takes it and, and either has really good advice for me or he just understands and hears and sometimes that's all that matters. So he's an amazing coach. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> so you are so full of energy. Now we are going to give you a chance to exploit. <laughs> One day I walk into the Takahashi Dojo in Ottawa and I see Priscilla on the mat. I didn't know who she is, but I see a girl or a woman, uh, yellow belt on her and, and doing stretching. And uh, one of the people who were very frequently in the dojo, she says, this is this blind girl, Priscilla, and she's pretty good. So watch her. And I, I watched and I said, holy shit. She is really good for a person with yellow belt and uh, and uh, a few years of judo in uh, in a small dojo in Barry. She was really remarkable from the very beginning. So, so I'm trying to enter into a circular movement. You are starting with the same movement and then you spin me down. Okay. Okay. Never back off. Okay. Okay. Let's go. I think when you're a coach to a para athlete, you, you're not just a coach. You have to be empathetic and it's a tight connection that you have because there's a lot of issues that go along with para that pulls a lot on him, I think, that he has to look at different resources, things he's probably not experienced, and he makes it look easy. <laughs> so he's, it's good, he's like a second father. Very good. Early on in their relationship, Andre recognized Priscilla isn't just a world-class athlete. She brings much more to the mat. Focus, just like you would in a competition, so. Most uh, of her uniqueness is her mental capacity. Uh, coaches from the international teams call her the lion heart in the small body, you know. They, they really uh, uh, enjoy seeing her competing because that's, you know, she, she is just like a tiger. She doesn't give up. She loves, loves to compete, 
the majority of the athletes uh, like training, but they hesitate uh, in competition. She loves to compete, and it's it's it's, it's, it's a joy to 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 see her. <laughs> That drive to compete Andre mentions has burned in Priscilla from a young age. But because leagues and organizations in her hometown of Sarnia, Ontario were not willing to give her a chance, she was forced to watch from the sidelines. It was horrible because you know what you're able to do. You know your own capabilities and it's your body. If you want to take the risk, you know, you take a measured risk. It's not life or death. So that was frustrating to me because it's like, what's the big deal? At home, I could do what I wanted. You know, my, my mom would, if she could wrap me in bubble wrap, she would have. But my dad was, you know, more like, yeah, she just needs a helmet and some, maybe some knee pads. She'll be all right. At school and at any organized, they wouldn't even let me play hockey. Um, they said I was an insurance risk and they wouldn't let me do it. It's like being handcuffed or caged. She was able to break out of that cage when she enrolled at W. Ross McDonald School for the Blind in Brantford, Ontario. I was finally free to do everything I ever wanted. And it surprised me the sports that they had for the blind. You name it and we did it. So it was really freeing in that sense. And it really helped me build that, that confidence. I knew I could do this and look, I can, you know? And, and so it kind of prepared me when I went back into the regular school system. While her time away at school wasn't perfect, W. Ross still holds a special place in Priscilla's heart. That's why she jumped at the chance to head back to her alma mater to share her story with the students. Thank you guys so much for uh, having me here today. It's a huge honor. It's very nostalgic. I hope they take away, kind of like what I told them at the school, you know, enjoy the journey. If you can find the gift in the hard things, uh, then it's worth living. It's not in vain. You didn't suffer in vain. And I feel like that's my story. I feel like I found a gift in, in my suffering. You know, my, my, the gift in my suffering was not being able to do things that other kids did. And my gift in that was, you know what, I can share my story with other people. And it taught me to be hard-headed. It taught me to be motivated. It taught me to persevere. If I can get someone else to learn these gifts in their hardships, then it's worth it. Don't take life too seriously. Take what you're doing seriously, but enjoy the ride. Enjoy the journey. Enjoy the ups and downs. A powerful message for a room full of students still finding their place in the world. Priscilla's father, J.C. Gagne, made the two-hour drive from Sarnia to hear his daughter speak, something he enjoys doing whenever he can. I think I'm going to ask uh, my dad if he could help me. I want to see who's been paying attention. <laughs> from a young age, J.C. remembers Priscilla refusing to accept the limitations others had placed on her. I thought uh, at first she, because she was stubborn, but she, she was not stubborn. She was uh, like she, her inner voice, or I don't know. You know, she she was convinced that that she uh, can do uh, something. You know, I can do that. I can, you know, uh, I can fight. I can uh, play judo uh, or bikes. You know what I mean? Uh, but uh, she got a lot of uh, determination. So that's uh, I think is a big uh, part of uh, of her too. But JC feels it was exposure to one specific sport in high school that really solidified her belief in herself. Even though she broke her nose and had to wear a padded black face mask for a while. And that wrestling program uh, opened her up uh, many things that I think she didn't believe she could. So, and uh, she likes it, eh? I loved the physical fight. I loved the adrenaline. I loved being able to muscle somebody. And I, I think, honestly, I probably didn't have the vocabulary back then to say it, but. Looking back, I think it was because I could do it as well as they could. There's no vision impaired wrestling, so I was in able body competitions, and I felt like this is one thing that we're on level ground. On top of the boost in confidence, wrestling lay the foundation for Priscilla's love of combat sport. But that was only one of the reasons she chose para judo. Well, it was my dream since I was a little kid to be in the Olympics. I didn't know they had Paralympics. So I wanted to do Olympics since I was about eight or nine or 10, somewhere around there. And so that, that's always been my dream. The only combat sport that I knew of uh, that was in the Paralympics was judo. So I contacted an old mutual friend and they got me in touch with a guy at the local dojo in my hometown and the rest is history. That history includes a trip to the 2016 Paralympics in Rio. It was incredible having family there, having my friends there from other sports that are in the Paralympics. So it was, 
it was and it was in Brazil. Uh, it was it was just a fantastic first experience. Despite living her dream by competing at the games, the way it ended on the mat was a nightmare. I was ahead until the last minute. I lost the bronze medal match, which was a it was horrible. It was like the sinking feeling when you hear the mate and there's nothing you can do. But I learned that even in the last second, everything can change, so you keep fighting to the last second. More to come on Level Playing Field. Welcome back to Level Playing Field. Sport Explained, Para Judo. Para Judo is a sport where partially sighted and blind athletes compete one-on-one -on -one in hand-to-hand -hand martial arts combat. Competitors, known as judokas, are trying to achieve ippon, or perfect score, which automatically wins the match. Ippon is achieved by throwing your opponent quickly and forcibly onto their back, submitting the opponent by armlock or stranglehold, or immobilizing them on their back for 20 seconds. If Ippon is not achieved, the match is awarded to the judoka with the most points earned through holds and throws. Judokas compete on a 10 meter by 10 meter padded mat called a tatami. Like in traditional judo, all combatants wear a judogi, or gi. A gi is comprised of three main parts. A large, loose-fitting cotton jacket held together with a cotton belt and oversized cotton pants. Unlike traditional judo, para-judo athletes start holding onto the other's gi. A red circle on a judogi indicates that the judoka is blind and a yellow circle indicates that they are deaf. Matches are five minutes for men and four minutes for women. Athletes are categorized in weight classes. If a match is tied once the time has expired, it is extended until someone achieves a point and wins the match. Now you're all set to throw down. Welcome back, I'm your host, Greg Westlake. Through hard work and determination, Priscilla Gagne has established herself as one of the toughest para judo athletes in the world. But she also has a softer side. Following her heartbreaking loss in Rio, Priscilla made a few changes. The biggest was moving to Montreal to be based at Judo Canada's National Training Center at Olympic Stadium and train with the team full time. I didn't decide until after uh, Rio if I was going to continue to Tokyo. So I knew I had to get stronger physically. I knew I had to get better with certain defenses. You don't allow me to do that. You don't pull towards you because if you pull towards you, I'm going to get there. So. The preparation was more specific to individuals and also more specific to scenarios that will come up. That's what we are looking for. The adjustment in her training wasn't the only change Priscilla made. As part of uprooting her life with the move, she also had to find a new church. That's right, the same woman who enjoys choking out opponents is a regular at the Evangel Pentecostal Church in downtown Montreal. She fell in love with her lively services but ultimately kept coming back because of the comfort she gained from the experience. Coming to this church was like an escape. It was like a it was like re-energizing. It was it was my refuge and it would build me back up to like okay, I can face the world again. While this particular church helped her through a tough time, it's her belief in God that guides her every day. My faith is everything to me. I don't think I'd be who I am today without it. I have a huge trust in God, and that no matter what I do, He's got my back. My flesh may fail, but my God, you never will. The people closest to Priscilla, like her coach, Andre Sedej, also recognize the benefits of her deep-seated beliefs. It helps her dramatically in her life, and it's a very positive development. And she liked, she loves life, but, and, and, and it's contagious. <laughs> there is no doubt Priscilla spreads joy wherever she goes. She has made two trips to the Ukraine as a missionary and volunteers regularly at the church whenever her training schedule allows. 
This devotion to helping others has also led to a close friendship with Pastor Pauline Richard from Evangel. Just like Andre, Pauline recognizes what drives Priscilla to act the way that she does. Her faith is, you know, and trust in God is, I think is what gives her the confidence and the drive to do what she does. Pauline also believes Priscilla's life experience compels her to step up whenever she sees others struggling. I think it gives her a deeper understanding of what someone else may go through. And so it's her way of saying, you know what? I've been there, I know what it is like, so I'm gonna come alongside of you and help you out. Priscilla's deep understanding of what it takes to overcome adversity doesn't just help others though, it also serves her well whenever she enters competition. Currently, all classifications compete for the same medals in para-judo. This means B1 athletes like Priscilla, who have little to no vision, go head to head with B2 and B3 fighters who can see much more. The questions we always were asked, can she really compete against athletes who are borderline visually impaired? As much as I wanted her to be able to compete against this kind of quality of competitors, I really deep in my heart had a hard time to believe in that. And she has proven me wrong. In Portugal, when she won a medal at the World Championships, she beat B3 Russian, former world champion, and she beat uh, Uzbekistani, and she beat them both decisively in Portugal. And, you know, if it happens once, it just happens but she beat them again equally decisively. And now they are ready for her and they want to beat her badly and they can. Personally, I kind of like the challenge, you know? That's just the competitor in me, I suppose. The next big challenge the competitor in her is eager to conquer is the podium at the Paralympics. Paralympic Games, there is no mercy, you know? There is, there is no second chance in judo, you, you go for a match, you lose, you're out. And there are going to be people who are going to go at her with all they have. I can't say I'm gonna walk in and get the gold and everything's gonna be peachy, you know. My goal is to give everything I have 100%, not hold back anything. So when I walk away, I can walk away with no regrets. I can walk away knowing I gave absolutely everything I had, both in training leading up, because honestly, the work is done before the games. Uh, you, you don't start doing well at the games. You, the work is, the training is either in you or out of you before the game starts. You don't know how to relax between, huh? <laughs> Always going, going, going fast. We are not working and uh, uh, sacrificing her health to, <laughs> to go and to be another time uh, fifth in the Paralympic Games, you know. Uh, she belongs on the podium and that's what we are aiming for. And, uh, well, um, I'll cry. There is no question about that. She is, uh, yeah, she is special. You meet a lot of great people in the world of Parasport, but Priscilla stands out. She truly wants to make the world a better place. And that's something she has in common with Holland Blurview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital in Toronto. After the break, we see how they're enriching the lives of children through the power of sport. Stay tuned for more Level Playing Field. Welcome back to Level Playing Field with Greg Westlake. Sport is a miraculous thing. It affects the lives of so many people, creating a lasting, positive impact. It also has the power to aid in healing and recovery. Nowhere is that more evident than at Holland Blurview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital in Toronto. I think sport has the ability to bring people together. That's Kristen English, therapeutic recreation specialist at Holland Blurview. She witnesses the impact of sport on young people every day gives sort of a common ground, something that everybody finds enjoyment in. They get a, a chance to um, express themselves, to communicate with others, find that home or that piece of comfort that they belong to. One of those people who have found a place to belong is 14-year-old inpatient Sunni Muhammad. Along with his mother, Samia Ahi, they have seen the impact firsthand. 
As a mother, what's it like for you to, to, to see your son enjoying sport while he's going through the rehab? It's amazing. I mean, this is the one thing that will really, that really motivates Sunni. They have a lot of activities here for kids. And I, and I hear that Sunni's been into some sports. What kind of sports does Sunni love, yeah. love playing? I like, um, wheelchair basketball. Wheelchair basketball? Yeah. I was fired up about the chance to play wheelchair basketball with Sunni, who didn't miss when I set him up for a shot. Apart from the in-house para-sport activities, Holland Blurview offers an adaptive sport equipment loan program. Kristen showed me some of their available pieces, including some of their sleds, which I was quick to spot. Very cool. Yeah, so this is our recreation equipment room. Okay. Um, so I know this, like I'm a sled hockey guy. So I know these, so if somebody just wants to get into sled hockey. Absolutely. Do you have to be a first timer or can anyone? Anybody, so sometimes we have people who maybe haven't played in a while and okay. they're looking to get out and get back into it. So we've got all kinds of different sizes, ones with different types of support. A simple piece of equipment like that might mean them participating with their peers versus not. So it's sort of a, an essential program here and something that really opens a lot of doors and opportunities for the kids. 17 year old outpatient Jesse Verrato Alangan fully recognizes all the opportunities gained through Holland Blurview. When I was a kid growing up, I was very isolated. But when I came here, I didn't even heard of, you know, para sports. But Holland Blurview has introduced me to a lot of things, like being how to cross the street how to cook, how to just get anywhere. I joined Jesse for some city volleyball and gained some valuable advice before we got started. My tip for you is don't get hit in the head. Okay, I'll try my best. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Despite the warning, I was still caught off guard. But I can tell Jesse is as passionate about sports as I am. Sport means to me is the way it makes me feel good. It makes, it makes me challenge myself. I need sports in my life. Like, I don't know what would I do if I didn't have sports. I went from a very shy kid to low confidence, low self-esteem to I can conquer anything because Holland Blurry showed me that nothing is impossible. Boom! Got it. Sport plays a huge role here. From an inpatient perspective, sport can serve as a huge motivator for these kids. A lot of their day is very busy with therapies and things, and um, sport is something that they're excited to participate in. It still gets them active, but it's also very social so that they can just be kids and have fun. For SUNY's mom, Samia, Paul and Blurview's impact reaches beyond sport. I think the fact that they look at the individual as a whole, it's not just, yes, he's had surgery, there's rehab, you know, from a, from a physical perspective. They cater to everything. I, um, I was able to learn how to put on my pants on my own. Nice. Yeah. That was a huge goal for Sunni, learning how to dress independently. Yeah. So that was absolutely huge. And I don't know where else I could get this. Where he's he's getting all of his needs, getting his medical needs, his physical needs, social needs. As a Holland Blurview client myself, it was great to learn about a few of their other services, as well as meet Suni and Jesse. For more information on the hospital, head to hollandblurview.ca. And if you want to catch up on other episodes of Level Playing Field, you can find them at ami.ca. I'm Greg Westlake. Thanks for watching. Host Greg Westlake, producer Ted Cooper, videographers Matthew McGurk, Darcy DeToni, additional camera Brian Roy, Glendon Davis, editor Manuel Grados Andrade, integrated described video specialist Simone Cupid, audio producer, composer, and engineer Mike Monson, graphics Andrew Antonello, Mike Smith. Senior Producer Michelle Dudas, President and CEO David Arrington, Copyright 2020, Accessible Media Inc.